worship in the words of the psalmist from Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let us praise the Lord as we join in the singing of our hymn from all that dwell below the skies, hymn 229 in the Blue Hymnal. Proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Thus, because of our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we dare with confidence to approach the throne of God's grace. Let us pray now together our prayer of confession, followed by a brief moment of solid confession by each one of us. Let us pray together. Gracious God, you have called us to hear your word and follow your way, yet we fail to hear your words. We are commanded to receive the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ, and yet we have not fully received him. We are called to bear your word into all the world, and yet we are too weak from carrying our own burdens. Forgive us for our lack of faith and refusal to accept your promise of strength. Forgive us for remembering our failures while forgetting your promises. Forgive our sins and restore us to that relationship which allows us to hear anew your good news. Receive your Son as Lord and be a church led by your Holy Spirit. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. If a person is in Christ, he or she becomes a new creature altogether. The past is finished and gone. 
friends believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. It is indeed a happy day when we have such joyful music presented by our youngest choir in the church, and we're thankful for their contribution to this worship service. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian on this beautiful November brisk Sunday day. A special welcome as well to those of you who worship with us by way of WYED-TV. We are First Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. We are located across from the state capitol at the corners of West Morgan and Salisbury Streets. And if your schedule in the near future brings you to Raleigh, we look forward to you joining with us in this sanctuary for worship. But we are thankful this Sunday for your partnership with us, by participating in this service of worship, for your prayers and for your financial contributions, which make this special ministry possible. To bring a moment for mission on behalf of youth ministry, which is quite an active program of this congregation, are two young people, and we invite them to come forward uh, at this time to share with us. Hayes Pramore and Robert Leonard. Hayes and Robert. The youth cookbooks are ready to sell. They are $8. They will be sold at a date to be announced. Check with Steve Austin for details. The recipes for the cookbooks were supplied by church members. 
The youth, group, the youth group compiled the information, had it published, and are selling them. The money is used for two purposes. Three-fourths of it goes to the Youth Activities Assistance Fund, which helps with youth trips. The remaining fourth goes to the Memorial Hall Debt Reduction. Now Hayes from Laura will tell you about youth group activities. Thank you. On behalf of the youth group, I would like to thank those of you who have already bought a cookbook and encourage those of you who haven't to do so. The money that goes to the youth fund helps support us in our many activities. Our youth are active as an individual church as well as in the presbytery. We have lock-ins, ski trips, the New Hope Retreat, the In the Oaks Retreat, a week at Montreat in the summer, special Sunday night activities like pizza and putt-putt, as well as other standard annual retreats. All of these are supported somewhat by the Youth Fund. Our youth also participate in many kinds of service projects. Just yesterday, members of the senior highs helped rake yards of appreciative older generation citizens. As you can see, the money made from the cookbooks helps the youth immeasurably, and we are grateful. I would like also to invite everyone not already attending youth to begin coming Sunday nights at 6. Well, not everyone can attend. Even if you feel like a youth at heart, you must be through grades 6 through 12. Remember to buy cookbooks, and thank you for supporting the youth. Our Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear the word of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand and fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And then we turn to the New Testament to hear the reading of the Word of God from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians Chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Again, hear the word of God. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads in every place the fragrance which comes from knowing him. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not peddlers of God's word like so many, but in Christ we speak as persons of sincerity, as persons sent from God and standing in his presence. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our hymn is number 325 in the blue hymn book. 327, excuse me, uh, in the blue hymn book, A Word of God Incarnate.
while the youth are leaving, let me tell you that it's not uncommon that I have to come in here and adjust the pulpit up or down, actually, from when Dr. Stock or Dr. Eller preached, but whenever one of the youth has to readjust the mic higher than I am, it's a little intimidating. <laughs> Thank you, Hayes. I want to read you the Word of God as it comes to us from the book of John, the f- gospel reading the first chapter, the first 14 verses, a passage you've heard many times before, and one that carries with it some of the mystery of who God is and how we understand Him. Hear now these words as we hear the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came to the Father, full of grace and truth. May God open our ears to hear this, his word, and our hearts to receive it. Let us pray. O God Almighty, be with us now as we hear your word and seek to understand it. Guide these words that they might proclaim you and not my own message. All this and more I ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It could be any church across the land, and there are people in it who, at the time the sermon begins, settle down and begin to kind of get comfortable and want to take some time and fall asleep. And I would love to do the same thing myself, but I came instead not to take a nap, but to preach to you and bring you the message, the quote, Word of God. And hopefully you came as well to hear the Word of God, not necessarily to hear my sermon as the Word, but to hear God's Word spoken, proclaimed. I hope that's what you came for, because if not, the question I'd have to ask is, why are you here? Why do any of us fill the churches on Sunday mornings to hear God's Word? And if you have come to hear God's Word, what is it exactly you've come to hear? And have you been satisfied yet? Have you heard it? Or are you still wanting to hear something else? You see, the Bible is one of the ways we hear the Word of God. It is the testimony, the witnesses that have come through the ages to tell us who God is and who we are in relationship to Him. But it also proclaims the other way of hearing God's Word, and that is hearing Jesus the Christ. Because Jesus, as John tells us, was the Word made flesh, the Word that came and dwelled among us, full of grace and truth. And so some of you want to come and hear the Word of God as it comes to us through Jesus. And that is the second and primary way by which we understand what this Word of God really is all about. But maybe there's some other way you've come to hear it, too. Maybe something else. Maybe in the liturgy, the the collection of wisdom of the church. For indeed, that is the third way we come to hear the Word of God, in our own words as the body of Christ. You see, when we come to this church, we can either hear the Word or we can do the Word. We can either receive it by reading it or we can be that Word. Now, let me give you a few examples and tell you a little bit more about this. If you read the Deuteronomy passage, maybe that's what you came to hear. You came to hear the Word of God proclaimed. We read the Scriptures every Sunday. That way you have before you God's Word, spoken, true. It came from the Scriptures. It came from the book, the good book, the Bible, the holy Bible. Maybe that's what you came for, was to hear the Word of God read and proclaimed, something from the Old Testament which points straight to God, says, this is our God. This is who he has been with the people of Israel all the way down through the centuries. Maybe that's what you came for, was it? Did you come to hear the word read out of the Old Testament? 
For indeed, the Old Testament is God's word. Many times we hear how God instructed people to write these words down. First off, where he tells Moses on the mountain itself that these are the Ten Commandments. Tell these people these words. Share them. And they become the law for the land, for the people of Israel. Here we understand that we are to take these words that you heard read out of Deuteronomy, which is known as the Shema. You've heard me say it before, and Shema is the big phrase for all of Israel. It's the collection of people who hear God's word. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Not something else, not anybody else, not a few gods, one God. And whenever anybody in Hebrew faith hears the word Shema, they know it's the call to hear God's word. Do you hear it? Do you hear these words out of Deuteronomy and understand that this says these are God's instructions, not just some words out of a book? If that's not enough, he tells us to make sure that we impress them on our children, to talk about them wherever we are, to write them on the door frames of our houses and on our gates. These are written words. They're communicated, shared, passed down from century to century. They're God's word. And if that's not enough, there are other passages. Turn to Jeremiah, and you remember where he tells Jeremiah that he must take these words and write them down, keep them for all the people to hear. And so Jeremiah passes the words down to Baruch, who acts like a scribe to write them down, almost like a legal contract. Write these words down. They are God's word, written as well as spoken. The Word of God is definitely a testimony, thus the New Testament, the Old Testament. They're a collection of witnesses of people's stories. If you and I went through this room and had everybody write down the story of their encounter with God, that would be the type of thing that could go in the Bible because you'd tell the story of how you were changed in encountering God. So it is the Word of God as a book, a collection of these stories. We know these stories, but do we really know them? Do you really hear all of the words when you have them read to you, or do we kind of fade out somewhere in the middle and remember just what comes up on TV or the, the children's stories we knew? Do we remember part of the story but not all of it? If you come to hear God's Word, you must hear all of it. As a Christian, you can't pick and choose the parts of the Bible you like and don't like. Thomas Jefferson did that. He went in through, actually cut out parts of his Bible because he didn't agree with what it said, didn't think it fit this message of who his God was. Do you and I do that? Is that the Word of God? No. Let me turn to a story in the passage of the wilderness wanderings when Moses has the people out of Egypt now and they're wandering looking for the promised land. And he goes up on this mountain to meet God and there to receive the Ten Commandments, the tablets from God. But while he's gone a little too long, in fact, the people start to grumble and rumble among themselves. And here's what they say. It's the story of the golden calf. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered round Aaron and said, Make us some gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. And it seems funny that it tells us that back then men wore earrings. Your sons and your daughters are wearing. So all the people took off the earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it from a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. And afterwards they sat down to eat and drink and give, got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down. You've heard the phrase, go down, Moses. Go down, because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone, so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Read on, it says, Moses turned and went down the mountain and with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands. With the two tablets of the testimony, the witness, the story, the covenant relationship, these are the words God gave us. With those two tablets of the testimony in his hands, they were inscribed on both sides, front and back. Most of us see pictures of Charlton Heston as Moses with these big tablets. And again, there's only a few words in writing on, both, on one side. The tablets contained the law, and they were written, as the Bible says, on front and back, both sides. 
The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Now, as a preacher, I've got to tell you, there are times when I want to remember the story a different way because I love to tell people that God's hand didn't come out of the clouds and write something for us, but it is still God's inspired word. And yet these words say this was the writing was the writing of God. Somehow these are his words. We have to receive them as such. And then when Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf that they had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? Now, those are harsh words to come from God. Here's a story of how God gives them the law to follow. And what they do is they turn away from that and automatically start worshiping other gods. You and I weren't there. You and I didn't stand at the foot of the mountain waiting on Moses to come down and finally get so frustrated we go build ourselves a golden calf with earrings. You and I weren't there to hear the thunder in the hills. You and I weren't there to see Moses come down transfigured, changed, looking different. You and I were not there, but someone was. And they communicated the story over and over again until we have it as a written story. We weren't there. We can't picture ourselves in the minds of these people. We don't know what they were feeling. But we can hear the words and get some glimpse of what it's all about. That's hearing the word of God. We can understand that God set up one relationship and they blew it and went another direction. We understand that in our lives. We can hear that this is God's word, pure and simple. But do we receive those words? The Bible is a written testimony. First and foremost, it is the account of the life of God and the people. So when you come to this place, maybe you did come to hear the word of God proclaimed that as God was with Israel, God is with us. But some of you know that the other way to receive the word of God is to receive Christ, to hear the words of Jesus. We know that, as John tells us, in the beginning was the word, capital W, and the word was with God and the word was God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only who came to the Father full of grace and truth. And John goes on to tell you that source is Jesus the Christ. The rest of the entire book's about him. Again, you and I, were not there to see Jesus walk. We weren't able to sit at the foot of the mountain and hear his sermon. We weren't able to walk up to him and ask for healing and receive sight or our hearing or to be healed. We weren't there to touch the hem of his garment, but somebody was and they wrote their stories down. If the words of John about all this, nothing was made without him and everything was made through him and he was light and he was truth, all these seem a little poetic and a little syrupy. He's trying to put into words the power of what Jesus was to the world, how he was so different from everything else that we knew he was the God, the Son of God. And he goes so far as to say he was the very beginning word made flesh. Do you and I receive him? Do we really hear that? Now, you may say, too, that this is all about Jesus, not hearing his words. Maybe you've come to hear the words of Christ in red, which, of course, if you turn to your Bible and have a red-letter edition, you can read just what Jesus said. There were times in my life when I turned just to those red words and looked through every one of them to find messages of hope and promise and, and encouragement. So that's what you've come to hear, maybe, to hear Jesus speak, to hear his words. Well, you and I must be grateful that someone was there to hear his words and to repeat them over and over so that we might have them written down for us to read and hear. But we also couldn't be there at that time. We have to rely on these words. We have to hear the word of God. We have to hear Jesus proclaim his teachings to us. But as surely as the book is more than just a book, it's something we're to follow. So are the words of Jesus something more than just a nice parable or an instruction of what the kingdom of God is like. It's the word we are to follow. It's easy to call ourselves Christians because we read the Bible. That does not make us Christian. What makes us Christian is following the word of God made flesh, living the life in the light of Jesus Christ. Do you and I come to hear that word of God? Have we come here to take this message of hope and really believe in it and share it? Or have we come simply to read another passage in the Bible, feel faithful for another Sunday, and go home unchanged. If you read these words, they are the words of people who were changed, 
The stories in the Bible are stories of how people are different now, no longer the same thing. You and I must read the Bible for ourselves. We must understand what it says because it is a book. It's something we can hold and to pick up and look at and understand. But it's far more than that. It's a living word. We must understand that it tells about, in the Old Testament, all the stories of how God impacted people's lives and how the relationship is to be followed, what the law is, what the covenant is. And it's the New Testament as well, a new testimony, a new witness to what God has done through Jesus Christ. The four Gospels are the four accounts of the life of Jesus, each one slightly different. That doesn't make Jesus different. It makes the different perceptions of him different. You and I must look at him for ourselves. We must come here not just to hear words read from the lectern or preached from the pulpit. We must come here not just to hear some words about a man named Jesus. We must hear those words and follow them. It's not something we just read and hear. It's something we hear and follow. Another person who's tried to put into powerful words what it must have been like for some of the people who lived back then was a man named Khalil Gibran who wrote a book called The Prophet. Many of you have seen that one, but he wrote another one named Jesus, the Son of Man. And in it, the whole book is a collection of personal accounts of what Jesus meant to different people. Now, these were not first-person accounts as we know they happened in fact, but this is one person's understanding of what would it have been like for Jesus to walk up to this person and heal them? What would it be like to see him pass by in the crowd carrying his own cross, knowing he was being mocked and tormented by people who didn't believe in him? What was it like to be frightened and scared of knowing you believed in him, followed him, and you were in danger as well? We have those words in the Scripture, but we have to put ourselves in the place, if possible, of other people to understand what they experienced. And this is a small section by a man named Nathaniel. They say that Jesus of Nazareth was humble and meek. They say that though he was just a man and righteous, he was a weakling and was often ridiculed and f confounded by the strong and powerful, and that when he stood before the men of authority, he was but a lamb among lions. But I say that Jesus had authority over men and that he knew his power and proclaimed it among the hills of Galilee and the cities of Judea and Phoenicia. What man yielding and soft would say, I am life and I am the way to truth? What man meek and lowly would say, I am in God our Father and our God the Father is in me? What man unmindful of his own strength would say, he who believes not in me believes not in this life nor in the life everlasting? What man uncertain of tomorrow would proclaim, Your world shall pass away and be naught but scattered ashes, ere my words shall pass away? Was he doubtful of himself when he said to those who would confound him with a harlot, He who is without sin, let him cast a stone? Did he fear authority when he drove the money changers from the court and the temple, though they were licensed by the priests? Were his wings shorn when he cried aloud, My kingdom is above your earthly kingdoms? Was he seeking shelter in words when he repeated again and yet again, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days? Was it a coward who shook his hand in the face of the authorities and pronounced them liars, low, filthy, and degenerate? Shall a man bold enough to say these things to those who ruled Judea be deemed meek and humble? Nay, the eagle builds not his nest in the weeping willow, and the lion seeks not his den among the ferns. I am sickened, and the bowels within me stir and rise when I hear the faint-hearted call Jesus humble and meek, that they may justify their own faint-heartedness. And when the downtrodden for comfort and companionship speak of Jesus as a worm shining by their side, yea, my heart is sickened by such men. It is the mighty hunter I would preach, and the mountainous spirit unconquerable. What would you say? If you were to tell your story about how Jesus has impacted your life, of what these words of 2,000 years or more mean to you, what would you share with a person as to how you feel as a different person now, or would you be unchanged? You and I must turn and hear the Word of God and realize it is the person of Christ, but we must follow those words. Maybe some of you who are the wisest in this crowd might realize you came to hear a different word of God, the word of God that is in us, the church. Maybe you've got a glimpse that as we come to proclaim through song and preaching and prayer and praise, 
that we are the Word of God, the church itself. Because if you and I believe that the Bible ended with the last page of Revelation, there's no sense in being here. If we believe that God does no longer any more work with us because it finished here in the book, then we've wasted our time showing up today. If you and I believe this is just a book with pages and ink, that it's not an inspired message of a relationship between God and his people, then go home. But if you believe that this word is continued in those who believe in him and receive him, then you know that you are the word of God. If you and I come to this place and realize we are not just to hear the word by reading, we're not just to hear the word and seek out parables of Jesus, we are to be the word of God, then you understand that the word of God is the message and purpose of the church. We are here for one thing and one thing only. We are not in the business of morals. The church is not in the business of values and ethics. It's not in the message bringing business of uh, policy setting. It's not in the type of thing we look into in our elections. We are not about those things. We are about one thing only, and that is proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord. If you do that, if you share those words of Christ with the rest of the world in need, and that informs or affects their message of morals and values, so be it. If by hearing what Christ can offer us, we have a different sense of purpose and value, so be it. If we set our policies to follow the commandments and the laws, great. But we are about one thing only, proclaiming Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you can empower other people. You can set them on fire. You can let them hear these words of promise and say they're for you. And then we would be the Word of God, living. You see, the Old Testament's been all about God and the relationship to the people. The New Testament's been about Jesus and his relation to those. The newest testament is us, the church, where the Holy Spirit dwells in us and informs us. When you and I share the word of promise that comes from these scriptures, when you and I talk about the impact Jesus has on us, then the Spirit is working through us to let others know the good news. Do you and I come to hear that as we hear the Word of God? You have to ask, why are you here? If it's just to hear a few simple passages read from the Bible, then we've missed the point. If it's to say, yes, I understand about Jesus and what he taught, and he has some neat parables, you've missed something else also. But to miss the understanding that we are to take all of that word is to miss the whole point. Because as surely as the Bible bears the story of God, we are to believe not in the Bible, but believe in the God the Bible proclaims. That's the word of God. We don't believe in the book. We believe the book in what it says about our God. If we believe anything, it had better be that our God is still alive and working today through us and in the Holy Spirit. That's when we are empowered to come here and no longer just remain indifferent, to hear the Word of God and go out and be that Word of God. Not in the business of morals and values, and we are not. But what we do does shape morals and values. What we do proclaim as far as a message of hope is to say that anyone who receives Jesus, anyone, can become by right, quote, a child of God. Yet all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born of God. Not just the people we like and the ones we would pick as our friends. Not just the people who do the things the way we do them. Not just the people who believe the way we believe, but anyone who receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that person is a child of God as well. That's the message of hope. And that includes us. For all of us have not received him as we should. If you came here today to hear anything, hopefully you hear that you cannot hear the word of God and remain unchanged. It must inform your actions. It must shape what you do. To go home and do nothing is worthless and a worthless to God. But to go home and share that message of hope, to live the life, to believe what it says, to love your enemies as well as your neighbors, that is to be informed and to be a different, changed person. One example of how changed a person was by these words is the story of a short monk. Short story of a monk. He may have been short. 
And he said this. One of the monks called Serapion told this story. He sold his book of the Gospels and gave the money to those who were hungry, saying, I have sold the book, which told me to sell all that I have and give it to the poor. That's to read the words and believe them. That's to hear the word and act. By the grace of God, hear the word in the Bibles. For the love of God, hear the message of promise in the person of Jesus Christ. But for God's sake, hear the word of God in yourselves as you proclaim Christ Lord. Be the word of God. That's what it means to come down to this church, not just to hear the word, not just to follow the word, but to be the word that all who hear might come to Christ. That's the message of good news and good hope. So as you leave this place, take with you not just the word as you hear it, but take with you the word that you are, the word of God. Amen. Let us now affirm what we believe as Christians as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. All those who are able will please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May be seated. Let us now unite our hearts and our minds in the fellowship of corporate prayer. Let us look to our God as we bring our intercessions, our thanksgivings to Him. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are worthy of the praise of every voice, the confession of every tongue, and the worship of every creature on earth and in heaven. Blessing and honor and thanksgiving and praise be to you, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We praise you, our God, for your word, which is revealed through the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. It can be to us a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We also praise you for that word of God incarnate in Jesus Christ, who was born in Bethlehem of Judea, who lived among us, who taught us, and who was sacrificed upon the cross for our sins, but who was raised again upon the third day and ascended into the glory and the power of your presence. O oh Lord, help us to respond to your word, both written and incarnated in Christ, and help us to be doers, obedient followers of that word, and not only those who see and hear the word. We give you, our Father, our heartfelt thanks for your mercies, for the abundant goodness and loving kindness that you show to us and to all your people. Your mercies are new and fresh every day. Your forgiving spirit never turns away the repentant sinner. And therefore, our God, we praise you for the multitude of your great blessing without limit or measure that we receive daily from your gracious hand. And we thank you, our God, that the sick were brought to Jesus, that they might be healed. 
and he did not turn them away without his blessing. We ask you to look with pity today upon all who come to you for healing of body, mind, and spirit. Grant to them your comfort and help and renewal. And grant, O oh Lord, to all those who have suffered great losses, especially in the death of loved ones, your spirit of faith and courage, that they may have the power to meet the challenges of the days to come with steadfastness and patience, and help them not to grieve as those who have no hope, but to remember that in Christ there is the hope and the certain hope of resurrection to eternal life through our Savior. And our Father, you have placed us in families, parents and children and grandparents and the extended family circle of loved ones so important to us. We ask you that you would enable us to live together in love in our family units. Give to us parents wisdom and guidance so that we may train our children in the ways that lead to goodness and righteousness and grant to all of the children of our congregation an attitude of honor and respect for their parents that their days may be full and long upon the earth. And our Father, as we have been reminded in our services in recent days, we are called to be faithful stewards of all your blessing and to dedicate our talents and possessions to your service. Lord, prepare us to use wisely and well all those rich blessings that you have placed in our hands and help us to be faithful Christians. Teach us daily more of your truth, more of your love, more of yourself, and grant that our lives may be made strong by the presence of your Spirit within us, that we may serve you gladly and faithfully and courageously as good stewards all of our days. For we pray this for the sake of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus told us it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let us now respond to that promise by giving freely of our treasure, of ourselves, to the glory of our God. Let us worship God with our morning offering.
Let us pray. Again, we praise you, our Heavenly Father, for all of your goodness to us. It's far beyond our deserving. In humility and gratitude, we come to you today with the thanksgiving of our hearts. And we pray, our God, that you would receive us because we give ourselves anew to you and that you would receive our gifts as manifestations of our love and service. Take us and these gifts and redeem them for the work of your kingdom, that your kingdom might come on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is Come Sing, O Church in Joy, number 430 in the blue hymnal. We'll sing the first and the last verses of that hymn. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Be with us all now and forever. Amen. Amen.